Coker is a healthcare business podcast from the Coker Group that focuses on solutions to help healthcare organizations effectively navigate the changing healthcare industry landscape. Welcome to Coffee with Coker, and uh, we're back with another episode talking about something that we've actually uh, been talking about on a, on a few episodes and forums lately in the last couple months, but it's something that has absolutely been very relevant to our clients and our audience. Uh, but we are talking about, once again, the um, changes that went into effect as of January 2021 to e and uh, coding protocols and procedures. And this is something that literally affects all hospitals and practices. So again, it's been very uh, keen interest to, to our clients. Joining us today, we have, once again, uh, kind of regulars on the podcast, but we have Taylor Cowart and Amy Greeter. Uh, both joining us and and um, before we jump in though I just I, I did want to uh, remind everyone tuning in please if you are interested in more content like this we ask that uh, you can subscribe to the podcast uh, distribution or on your uh, preferred platform where you listen to your podcast um, you can go to our website at cogroup.com and uh, find all of all of our episodes as well as other content. Um, you can also find that at coffeewithcoker.com. So again, thanks for listening and please, uh, we encourage you guys to subscribe and follow us on social media for our regular updates. So with all that said, um, let's dive in. So Amy and Taylor, we'll, we'll make sure there's a link to the article that you all wrote and it was very informative. And what you guys talked about were kind of the, the positive and negatives for, for hospitals and, and medical groups to be thinking about as it relates to these coding changes. And I, I guess, why don't we talk about that? And and I, I guess I'll frame it like this and I'll let whoever, whichever you wanna kind of start this off, but maybe we'll talk about kind of the winners and the losers as it relates to um, who's gonna potentially benefit the most out of these changes and then what are some of the things to look for as far as um, kind of the downside or potential downside effects for these changes? So maybe let's start with some of the winners and, and I'll throw it to you all and let you um, explain it from there. Thanks, Mark. This is Amy and I'll jump in with some of the winners. That's always the more fun topic uh, to cover. So the reality is, as you said, there are winners and there are losers. And so both our medical practice and our hospital clients need to be aware of both ends of that spectrum. On the winner side, we're seeing people that are experiencing a positive impact in their reimbursement in the specialties of endocrinology, family practice, hematology and oncology, even some in psychiatry, neurology, nephrology. Internal medicine goes up a little bit uh, at about 4% but less than family practice, which is about 13%. So between those couple specialties, there's a range. Endocrinology is one of the bigger winners at 16% prospective uh, positive increase as a percentage in reimbursement. And then down to that internal medicine, who is still grateful to be at 4%. Because as you said, Mark, there's a cadre of losers in this situation. And I'll let Taylor jump in on those that are unfortunately, on the lower end of the stick. Um, but the reality is that there have to be some offsetting penalties here. So Taylor, tell us a little bit about who doesn't come up on top. Yeah, absolutely. So I think kind of taking a step back, what we mean by losers. So we've seen in a lot of the literature that's come out about the E&M changes and even in the things that Coker has published, what we're seeing is that the, the work RVU amounts are all increasing for these um, coding changes, right? So work RVUs are increasing, but this is a budget neutral change. So reimbursement has conversely decreased. Well, how that affects you based on what you kind of um, are historically on your specialty billing um, kind of decides whether or not you will end up losing or truly increasing under this system. And and just as a, as a clarification, we're saying these percentages CMS has published them in their in the rule kind of as a, this is kind of what we expect to see the shakeout to be, but they have emphasized, and we will emphasize as well, that this is just kind of a general projection. These aren't hard and fast rules. You shouldn't necessarily make your budget on it, but definitely um, dig into your own specific specialties and your own practice financials and kind of a, and project how you might fare under your specific situation. So um, you know, the negative people are kind of the opposite of what Amy was talking about, which um, are sort of more of our proceduralists. So 
anesthesiology, GI, general surgery, ophthalmology, orthopedic surgery, um, PT and OT, and radiology are some of the ones that we've highlighted in this article. Again, I'll also note that in an article we posted, there is a uh, much more comprehensive list that was published with the CMS rule. So if you do, if we haven't mentioned your specialty, it's included there and you can go find it if you do want to go look that up. And to your point, Taylor, explaining the context is great. And I think we also have to cover the why. Why are there these big losers and big winners? I think one of the most significant drivers is just this massive change in the ENM coding and the weighting of the respective ENM codes. So, for example, our ENM codes ranging between 99202 and 99205, which are the new office visits, as we all know, increase in the range of 7 to 13 percent. And then the RVU values for the ENM codes between 99212 and through 99215, which are our established office visits, increase by a whopping range of 28% to 46%. And so the reason that so many of the winners come out as winners is because they have a largely ENM driven practice. Family practice obviously has a significant amount of patients that are going to be coming through in that established office visit uh, coding. And so looking at 28 to 46% there, that's the big driver for why they win on this overall strategy. And so I think it's important to recognize that this is not necessarily any indication of changes in practice patterns. As Taylor said, you know, the projections that were included in the final rule are based on just what you do right now. And again, that's largely predicated on these ENM coding versus, as Taylor said, more of the surgical specialties, et cetera. If you increase the value, whether it's at a, at a relative value unit, the work RVU, or, or just the, the value uh, that CMS assigns to the, um, the actual codes, should we assume that uh, at a grand scale or the big picture that what the values of those units were worth prior to 2021 are now just automatically higher. So what does that mean? I guess I'm trying to break this down when I think about physicians and providers and what it means for their compensation. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think that the kind of what we were referencing earlier, so the work our reviews are all technically going up. So if you're an employed provider, um, you're likely on a work RVU based compensation model, right? So Theoretically, what you're going to see is that your total work RVUs are going to increase, and therefore your compensation related to those work RVUs will increase. It's a you know typically just a straight, and uh, this is sim- oversimplifying it, but a dollar per work RVU. So if your work RVUs go up and your dollar amount stays the same, you're going to get additional compensation. But what what a lot of people are going to see is that if the reimbursement is declining associated with those um, work RVUs, and specifically for specific specialties, your hospital is obviously, as a financial steward, going to have to adjust that compensation accordingly. And so they're definitely, and this is kind of the negative side of um, some of these specialties, even from an employed standpoint, there might be an adjustment to um, your dollar per work RVU going forward. So um, I think that's that's important to remember. And I, I also will say, you know, I, I was talking to my dad the other day, who's an OBGYN, and he was saying that, that his hospital is already addressing this. And because of his specialty, which um, tends to be obviously kind of in the middle ground, right? He does a good bit of surgeries, but he's also seeing a lot of patients in the office. And so his, they expect to wash out and they're not expecting to change his dollar for work RVU amount. Um, so that's just one example, but hospitals are talking about this. And if you are employed and you're hospital hasn't brought it up yet, expect to see that change coming down the pike because you you either will see that decrease or potentially, theoretically, you could see an increase based on, you know, trying to reassociate yourself with the market. Um, you know, I think it's also an interesting year when this is happening and our market data is going to be somewhat confusing based on the past year we've had. And so it's going to be an interesting year as we want to adjust to these changes in in coding and also the trying to reflect the market situation, which is very, very fluctuating in 2020 due to the impact of COVID. Yeah. Well, I guess, and the other kind of obvious uh, potential option, which 
probably is not ideal is just that the hospitals eat the uh, increased payments that go to the to the uh, providers, uh, meaning they just pay them more and you know have to kind of uh, accept that if they're not able to adjust those rates and those models uh, that are already in place. Um, or, or think about some sort of other alternative. And, and, you know, I think that's what a lot of them are looking at. We, we have, and, and again, we'll make sure this is available as a link to, um, it's on our website. Um, but we'll, we'll make it available in the show notes that, uh, we, we developed a, a calculator that can help uh, people determine what the adjustments ultimately are, uh, meaning the impact of physician comp. Uh, based on the changes in the uh, the values and the uh, of the E and M codes, so I think that's a helpful. That's been a helpful resource for people because you kind of get an idea what kind of impact are we talking about, depending on the specialty. And I think your example of OBGYN Taylor is is good in that there probably are a number of those specialties, uh, particularly ones that have a surgical component to it or or other types of procedures that um, may balance out a little bit more, but still have an upside potentially there for the physician, at least uh, from a compensation perspective. What, what else does we think about, you know, some of the uh, kind of going back to the positives, Amy, and when we think about, you know, the, some of the things that our clients are looking at, whether it's a hospital or a group, you know, yes, on the surface, it seems like certain specialties are in line to essentially do more, make more, however you want to put it, and maybe even across the board, there's potential for increased comp uh, to some extent. But what else do you see kind of playing out now that we're, as we're recording this, uh, a month into these changes? Yeah, good question. So Taylor referenced the $1, you know, difference. And really, the it's almost precisely that, you know, the the Medicare conversion factor has is going to be in the final rule thirty four dollars and eighty nine cents rounded in twenty twenty one versus thirty six dollars and eight cents in twenty twenty. So we're really talking about you know a dollar a dollar twenty of a difference here. And I am I am going to date myself here with this comment, but when my kids were smaller, we used to take them to the mall, which. People probably in 20 years are not even going to know what a shopping mall is. They're only going to know what online shopping is. But I always have quarters in my wallet for tolls or for parking meters. And so when I take my kids to the mall to bribe them to be good while I'm trying to shop, I would give them each two quarters. And so they could then take their two quarters and put them in any of the fountains uh, in or around the shopping mall complex. And so I wouldn't think twice right about that dollar because to me, it was an investment in good behavior out of my children while I got to go to Ann Taylor. And so I think that there is a propensity for some people to think about this as, well, it's just a dollar or it's just a dollar 20. And I think when you're on the upside of things, it's really easy to think about that as a buffer that you have. And I think it would cover going forward a lot of poor behavior, to be honest. And I think some people may get a false sense of realism so that they can kind of do what they want. I think it's really important that we give a little bit of caution to those certainly who are on the you know biggest loser list, as well as those that are on the positive side, that every dollar matters. And that means you can get lax in something like your coding patterns in terms of your revenue cycle management, in terms of investing in your technology, such as your EMR templates that are updated, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that you have both the infrastructure and the operations to support what's going to be your new operational realities going forward. You need to make sure that you're covering all of those EMM coding increases as well as making sure that you're not going to be totally lost for that just a dollar that you're going to experience in your conversion factor. So I would say, just as a word of caution, just like the people who are on our you know, lower end of things need to get wise in terms of what they're doing, so too do those people that are on the upside. So wh- one of the things I wanted to kind of think about as we bring this full circle is I'm sure there are multiple takeaways and 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 action items to think about uh, on all of this. But what would you say is one of the bigger things that, um, whether you're a group or, or or on the hospital side, what's one of the bigger takeaways that you kind of could see coming out of this, or that at least needs to be on the radar with these people? Right. So I think with the with the people, and I I I kind of hate now that we've coined the term losers because no one is a loser. 
Um, but there are practices that are definitely going to be more challenged in 2021, right, by this. And it, you know, their reimbursement is potentially going to decrease. And, you know, if you look at some of these specialties, I mean, you know, it doesn't seem like that much, but, you know, 6% for general surgery. Well, that's, that's a good bit of money if you've got a relatively large practice. And in, especially in a situation where you might be coming off a year where you're already financially struggling or just in general, you every single year, you feel like reimbursements are decreasing and you have struggled to keep up with financial expectations of running a private practice. Um, that can be a lot of money. And so it is, um, it, it definitely is a serious thing to consider and to, to kind of prepare yourself for what your options are. And I, you know, I think that the important thing is there are a lot of options available. And I think you know, what we're seeing is that some of our clients who have been historically really proudly independent are now seeing, you know, this the consolidation that's happening in the market, that it really could be a positive to them. And one of the things Amy and I talk about a lot with people is I think that there is this inherent fear that if you quote unquote partner with a hospital, that it means employment, that it's always going to mean employment, that that's the only option that you're selling your practice. Um, and the only way to, to really get that stability is to give up all your autonomy. And Amy and I have a lot of articles on um, professional services agreements or PSAs, and we have a white paper that's linked in this blog, but, um, but you know, we do a lot of work in this arena. Um, but there are lots of other options. And, and as we, you know, have gone through some changes in the last few years, you know, as we look at site neutral payments, et cetera, these PSAs continue to show that there are opportunities um, for both parties and, and for organizations, private practices to partner with hospitals without them having to become fully employed and really resulting in a win-win. So whether you, you know, start considering employment when maybe you haven't before, or you just truly want to discuss what some of these options look like, I think this is a great impetus to start that discussion. Um, you know, again, as you're faced with some of these declining reimbursements, um, again, building on something on a year that's probably already been highly challenging as a private practice. Yeah, which which also may be a, a, a positive as well for the hospitals that are looking to affiliate with more groups. Um, this may a good, be a good time uh, for, for those deals to really make sense. And again, it doesn't have to be an employment deal, like you said. I think the, um, the interesting thing there, and we, we talked about this, was, um, you know, the compensation changes or the, the you know, the work RVUs in totality have gone up. So really, if you're on that compensation program, which again, can exist in a PSA or in underemployment, that you could potentially see, you know, your compensation stabilize A or potentially increase because the work RVU totals are going up. So um, I just, it's just, I think there's a lot of opportunities there if you are willing to consider partnership. I think that there are also some opportunities, Mark, as you said, if you're on the hospital side, you know, you may be looking at an opportunity where you can start to bring people into the fold, particularly in some of the specialties that have been heretofore underrepresented in terms of their alignment with hospitals. And that can be, you know, something as detailed as ophthalmology. It could be all the way to orthopedics. You know, some of the specialties that have been either not needed to affiliate or have been more independently minded in the future, this may be an opportunity for you to sit down with them as true partners and have a conversation with them about how you can meet each other's needs going forward. So I think it doesn't have to be a desperation on the part of the practice, but it can really open up some doors to have, you know, bilateral discussion about how we help each other going forward. We've all kind of come off our rough year in 2020. We've got some changes happening in 2021. How do we work together so that going forward, we're the strongest, best provider of stable clinical services for our community. As I'm thinking about the, uh, you know, kind of preparing for, even though that we're already in it, I, I think um, one of the things that it stands out to me, and I'd love to get your insight on it, is uh, the, the importance of kind of getting in front of this, which again, kind of sounds a little backwards since we're already in it, but this is something that's going to be a, a progressive change. I have to think that there's there's going to be a number of operational things that need to be addressed is just just to deal with the changes, just to incorporate, to, to be prepared uh, from a process standpoint, whether it's a, an independent practice or a, a hospital owned group or, a, you know, hospital employed uh, individual 
provider. Uh, but but having certain things, what what are your thoughts there as far as kind of being ready to absorb this uh, from an operational standpoint? Sure. So I think it's a lot of the things Amy just mentioned, which is, you know, you need to make sure your providers are, are trained in these changes as well as your coders, depending on how your practice operates. Um, revenue cycle management personnel, you know, I think some of the big changes that we haven't really talked about here are really how the EM codes will work going forward. So um, there's a there may be a time component, et cetera. And so making sure that your systems are set up to properly address that it is going to be really important. And, and also, if you are a winner, you know, make sure you get all of the bang for your buck. If you if you do have the opportunity to to really be successful under this new paradigm, um, take advantage of it and make sure that you do, you know, train your people in a way that will um, make sure you get every dollar that's that's allowed that you're allowed to receive. So, you know, to that point, again, set up your EMR, make sure you have the right templates and support, you know, go through the training with with all the people that are participating in that. Um, and then continue to, you know, develop that audit process and ongoing education, you know, ensure again that that your people are um, working under these new rules, especially with something that is so ingrained and so, you know, typical of a daily operations of a medical practice. I think sometimes it can be easy to slip into old habits, you know, just from a trying to get the work done standpoint. Um, and not to mention, we know physicians, it's one of their least favorite part is this this portion of it, which is putting it into an EMR and making sure it gets um, billed appropriately. And even if you have help, you know, making sure that those requirements are in there um, so that you can bill to the greatest possible um, extent is, is going to be really important. Yeah. Taylor has said it extremely well. I would just add to a comment that Taylor made earlier, you know, so much of the compensation structures that exist today are predicated on benchmark data. And so I think we need to use this time that we have right now to figure out how we're going to use benchmark data going forward and what alterations we need to make to be successful in our go forward compensation model. So Taylor said, we've got the 2020 impact of COVID. Now we're going to have this impact from the uh, Medicare final rule. And I think the data from 2020, 2021 is going to come out in the next one to two years. But again, contracts uh, might have terms that can't be changed, you know, for less than a year. Obviously, that's a good practical rule for many compliance situations. You know, you keep a contract for a year. So I think we need to be a little bit more foresighted to think about what changes do we need to make now so that as those realities come up and as we start to see some what we anticipate to be significant changes in the benchmark data, how are we going to be prepared to use that going forward? Yeah, because there's definitely going to be, well, I could foresee there being some pretty significant outliers um, as far as the unique data uh, from, you know, with those things that you mentioned, Amy, and since it does lag a year to two years and we use it ongoing, you know, that could be interesting to see the impact it has on not only setting contracts or renegotiating contracts, but the fair market value limitations of those contracts, which is a completely different subject, but certainly ties to um, these changes and, and it'll be something that we have to monitor going forward because the standards that were there in 2020 uh, using 2019 and prior data is uh, may not be the case in 21 and 22 and beyond. So um, I think that that'll be something that we definitely have to keep our eye on. And and which which goes back to uh, kind of my fi my final question is, um, you know, Taylor, you mentioned the example of your father and uh, the system that he's affiliated with. Um, and how they've already communicated that. And I, I assume based on what you said, they've done probably some pretty significant analysis to understand uh, where they need to be and, and how they need to address that. Are y'all seeing that with uh, a number of the clients? And I guess this is really more for our, the, the hospital clients out there or groups and, and, and individual providers that are employed or affiliated with hospitals. Are y'all seeing that they're kind of getting ahead of this, doing the analysis and then communicating this on the front end with their providers, or are we still in this kind of figuring it out phase? And, you know, it may have to be some going back after the fact and making adjustments. What do you think? It just what are your observations, I guess? So I think like with most things, we have clients that are very prepared. And then we have clients that, that are kind of on the wait and see approach. And I will say my dad's affiliated with a large system. So they do have the resources to kind of start 
these things early. Um, you know, some of our other smaller systems, they, you know, they, they're a little bit more on that wait and see approach. And, you know, part of it's just a resource constraint. Obviously, in a year like 2020, when hospital administration was being pooled in literally every direction, you know, I we are not sitting here and saying that you have, this is something that maybe you even have the capacity to think about. Um, but it is here. It is now happening. Um, and so if you haven't had the opportunity to take this, take a step back and look at it again, completely understanding why um, now is the time to do so, because there are some things that are, are going to be impactful. And again, um, you know, physicians have had a crazy year, health systems have a crazy year and how we are really going to um, adjust compensation expectations, et cetera, going forward it is going to be key. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, like you said, they have so much, so many different priorities they are still trying to deal with but but there is a not only a financial impact to this uh, or an economic impact, but there's a there's a regulatory and compliance impact as well. Um, there's a component there that you know if they they don't want this to be something. No one wants this to be something that they just didn't weren't able to get to, and then in the future it comes back in some sort of OIG review or uh, you know review around fair market value and commercially reasonableness and. Um, so it is something that will have to be addressed, I guess. It's not a, a really option, but um, it's definitely could be another challenge uh, on the on the list of already existing challenges for for many systems out there. So, um, well, I, I think this is this has been very helpful. Um, again, we'll make sure the links to the article as well as the payment calculator are available again in the show notes, but they're, they are both on our website. So uh, we encourage everybody to go review those. And, and again, as I've said, and we've talked about this before, this is going to be something we continue to talk about literally throughout the year, because uh, this is this is an ongoing thing that our clients are having to uh, learn to, and uh, learn and understand and then you know, deal with, negotiate however uh, best they possibly can. So um, thank you, ladies, for uh, your time. And we'll look forward to continuing the discussion moving forward. Thanks. Thanks for having us. We hope you enjoyed that episode of Coffee with Coker, and we thank you for listening. We want to encourage all of our listeners to participate and contribute in the podcast. Uh, So if you have any questions uh, on any of the things we discussed in this episode, any of the topics that were presented, please feel free to ask us. Also, we welcome your feedback and suggestions. If you have any ideas uh, related to the, the material we discussed in this episode, or again, or in any episode, please let us know and we'll make sure to incorporate it. And if you have ideas for topics you'd like to hear more information about in future episodes, please send those suggestions to us. We'd love to hear them and we'd love to incorporate them into our future episodes. Uh, You can find us online and on social media. Start with our website and specifically the podcast is coffeewithcoker.com. You can also find that through the main Coker website at cokergroup.com. You can also find us on social media, Twitter at Coker Group. And then on LinkedIn, you can search for Coker Group and find our page and and the page for uh, some of our team members as well there. So you can find us and reach out to us a number of places. And then if you want to contact us directly, one of the best ways to do that, email feedback at cokergroup.com. That's feedback at cokergroup.com. And again, we'd love to get your feedback. And we'd love to encourage everyone to subscribe to the podcast so that you can be notified when future episodes are released. Uh, We look forward to uh, the next episode and we look forward to getting your suggestions and feedback on this episode. Thanks for listening and we look forward to speaking with you again on future episodes.